Hello. So if you've been following my page, you know that I just competed in the Edelweiss raid in Austria. Uh, some people had some questions about it, so I figured I'd put together a little talk, explain sort of how we trained and how the race went, sort of a first-hand account. And if this sort of stuff interests you, maybe it'll give you a starting off point on what sort of things to train for if you're interested in trying to get onto the team uh, the next year the race is held in 2025. I'll post this on Spotify and YouTube. Just a heads up on the YouTube video, I'll include maps, photos, and videos. Big thanks to Max Archibald for coming along and taking some great pictures. I'll link to his pages as well. So in this talk, I'll just cover the race itself. Uh, it was two days, approximately 40 kilometers and about 4,000 meters both up and down. So for the start, we lined up by team, all 22 teams right next to each other uh, in a line. Uh, you know, we got three teams of PLA to my left, uh, a bunch of German teams to our right. Uh, you know, everyone's hooting and hollering. Uh, really excited for the race. I'm just trying not to adrenaline dump, you know, the first 10 seconds of the race. So they shotgun start, uh, everyone's <laughs> running with their skis in tour mode and skins on, people tripping over each other, and the first station is the avalanche rescue. So they had two avalanche beacons, uh, two of the eight racers uh, gave up their beacons the day before, and they got buried underneath the ground. The ground was groomed, uh, was maybe six, inches to a foot underneath some some heavy groomed snow you know we had some people designated as people with shovels some people designated with their uh, beacons in search mode found the two beacons uh, put our stuff away and it was off to a long climb uh, we were one of the first teams to to leave the avalanche station uh, and we got to this long climb about a thousand meters of elevation over about uh, 2,000 uh, meters of distance. Uh, so we went from about 1,700 meters of elevation to 2,700 meters of elevation. Um, <clears throat> could have been all in my head, but I felt like at this point the elevation was affecting me. I was out of breath sooner than I thought I would be. Um, and like I said, we were one of the first teams to that station. And then by the time we got to the top, uh, we were <laughs> actually one of the last teams. Uh, but, you know, a bunch of teams were passing us. We were st stopping, uh, taking a break to drink some food and water about every uh, half hour. Um, you know, teams are blowing by us, looking real tired uh, you know, in, in our heads. We thought there's no way they could keep up this intensity for uh, two days. Uh, turns out some of the teams did. Uh, so we, we got to the top of that hill climb and that was probably the, the worst hill climb of the whole race. Um, took a couple hours but we get to the top and there's a pretty sketchy traverse where there's uh, maybe three foot wide of snow and on the right side of that three foot patch is a rock face that you know goes 30-40 feet up uh, and then the left side is a steep drop that goes down hundreds of meters. Uh, so that was a, a sketchy traverse where your legs are tired from from uh, from that hill climb and uh, yeah, trying not to fall down that. Uh, so we get across that. And then we get to the rappel station. Uh, just we set up a uh, a a dead man anchor with a set of skis and rappelled down. Uh, pretty steep snowy slope. The hardest part was dealing with how deep the snow was. We get down that and then you transition to rope skiing for about four to five kilometers. This is easily the most dangerous part of the whole race. So you have eight skiers tied to approximately 50, 60 meter rope and it's all sorts of skiing. So you're skiing down some steep uh, downhills, up some steep uphills everything in between 
some flat traverses. Uh, I wouldn't say this was the most practical skill, uh, but it definitely tests ski ability probably the most of the whole race. Uh, this was when uh, we saw two of the, two of the injuries. Uh, one of the uh, Chinese teams, I guess, uh, broke his leg somewhere along this route. And then uh, one of the Czech teams we saw, uh, one of them got a dislocated shoulder. Uh, teams, teams that knew the route ahead of time probably made up a lot of time here by knowing exactly when to have everyone transition uh, from downhill to uphill. Uh, they knew when to take the skins off and, and, uh, and lock their heels down versus, versus maybe just uh, a skate ski uh, if they need to. But um, every time you transition, obviously, that adds time. Uh, and then over two days, every transition, you know, that adds up to hours. So we skied down, you know, it's probably about four or five kilometers that we're skied, we're tied together. Uh, we get down to the casualty hauling station. So this, we had two sled halves. Uh, we, you know, two of our eight team members uh, skied with uh, these half a sled strapped to them. And then when it came to an event, they had to take the sled off and assemble it. Our sled halves didn't exactly lock into place. Uh, but besides that, uh, the, the casualty hauling stuff went pretty smoothly. You know, one of the members gets lowered down with the sled, uh, had to put the one of the support people in the sled, and then we hauled them up. We used a, a two-to-one with a, a snow picket anchor using one of our skis. Uh, and again, it, it's hard because of how much snow was there. You know, it wasn't exactly a, a cliff head. It was a snowy slope. So part of the difficulty is wading through that snow. Then the next station we got to was range estimation. So they used printed out pictures of people in tanks. Uh, they gave us the dimensions ahead of time. So we knew, you know, how wide that tank is supposed to be in meters versus, you know, when you get there, you see how wide it is in mills with, you know, a pair of binoculars or something. And then you give them using that, uh, the formula for mils to meters, uh, how far you think they went, uh, excuse me, how far you think the tank is. Again, it's just a piece of paper that's actually, you know, 20 meters away from you. Uh, felt pretty rushed, didn't really get a time to eat or drink because this is the event that I uh, volunteered to uh, partake in. Uh, so a big mistake on my part was doing the event and uh, feeling rushed enough not to eat or drink anything. By this time, uh, when you're done with that, you get to the second steep climb of the day. Uh, by this event, every team that was behind us was uh, did not finish because they, they didn't reach the cutoff in time or they had an injury. Uh, so we knew that we were only really racing ourselves uh, by this point and our goal was to finish the day. Uh, <clears throat> my energy crashed pretty hard here as we were moving up this slope. Uh, I actually had to pass some stuff off from my pack. Uh, the most difficult part of this climb was actually uh, that the rest of the teams uh, had already skied this. So you had, you know, maybe 17 other teams that already skied this route. And so the ski tracks were two, you know, ski width tracks that zigzagged up a icy slope and uh, it was a warm day so I think that when they were moving up the slope everything melted and compressed and then by the time we got there it was later in the day and everything froze over so it's pretty icy uh, we had to do a kick turn about every 50 to 100 meters and that was getting pretty difficult uh, and then every time someone blew a kick turn, you know, that's wasting energy. It's demoralizing them. It's holding up the rest of the team. So just like simple math, if three of the eight members mess up, a, you know, every kick turn, you know, that's adding, you know, 30 seconds maybe per turn. And then, you know, say there's 20 kick turns, that's adding up to, you know, close to 10 minutes uh, just based on messing up kick turns. Uh, so... 
and on top of that, how much fatigue you feel when you're, you know, flailing around trying to mess around with your your skis. Uh, so going forward, uh, you know, I would definitely practice kick turns and uh, trying not to be last. Uh, so we almost got to the top and then we had to switch to boot packing because of how difficult it was on skis. Uh, we could clearly see most of the teams ahead of us uh, were able to keep their skis on and probably because the snow was softer uh, during the heat of the day versus how icy it was after the sunset. Uh, so every time we had to stop and transition, you know, that adds a couple minutes. So that added up. We reached the top of that second slope and we had the ski down. Uh, wasn't bad, uh, but by that point our legs were, were pretty toast and the route was well traveled. So you're, you're skiing these, uh, these difficult sort of like natural moguls. Eventually we got down to the tree line and the skiing got pretty difficult. Uh, there was some, some dense trees on steep slopes. You know, there was an obvious line that teams had taken, so that was helpful to show the easiest way down through the trees, but it was pretty skied off and icy at the same time, so it was easy to route find but hard to ski. We got down uh, out of the trees and we ended up on a snow-covered road. There was a truck waiting with our overnight duffel bags. That There's just three duffel bags basically with our sleeping bags and stoves and, and stuff like that. Total weight was probably about 100 pounds. Uh, so we, we used our cordage to hook up four people to our skeds, uh, our uh, sled that we assembled. And we started the uh, around 3K march up the snow-covered road. Of course, like I mentioned earlier, our sled didn't, uh, stay together uh, like it was supposed to and we had to uh, use some cordage and clove hitches to uh, retie it together to make sure it stayed uh, stayed together. Overall I thought this part was pretty easy compared to everything else we did that day. Uh, other teams made it seem like it was a really hard event but I guess it depends on how hard uh, you pushed that day and what you packed in the overnight bags and obviously how hard you were pushing uh, at, at the time of that sled drag. Again, our mentality was we're already in last and not winning any prizes. And, you know, we have a whole nother day ahead of us. So let's finish strong, but be able to perform the next day. Uh, so we got to the bivouac, set up our tents, uh, ate some food and uh, went to sleep. Day two, we woke up, packed up the tents, and moved approximately one kilometer to the starting line. Uh, it started with a slight hill climb, and then uh, basically the reverse of what we skied roped up on day one. Um, I mentioned that there was that sketchy traverse the day earlier, so now we're, we're hit that in reverse and uh, going back the other way. Uh, as we got there, there was sort of a bottleneck of other teams uh, because only one person can move across at a time. Most of the teams were uh, boot packing at this point because it was so skied out. We watched a skier from the Czech Republic boot pack across the traverse uh, with his skis strapped to his pack and he actually fell off the traverse, you know, tumbled maybe 30 meters, but his ski skins ripped off his skis and one of his skis came off his pack and that thing rocketed down you know, a couple hundred meters, uh, so that kind of sucked for him. Uh, as we passed the team, I think one of the Czech guys decided to go down and, and get that ski, so he started down climbing on the rocks. It was pretty impressive. We got across that sketchy traverse, and now the slope starts to go back downhill. So now we're skiing down that first long climb from day one. Uh, we get the sled. Uh, assembled uh, and all tied up and uh, I was the lightest person on the team so I got the pleasure of being the patient. Uh, we assembled the sled, I got in it, I put my my pack underneath my lower legs. Um, we were supposed to go uh, about 1k down uh, so in my head I was like that's not so bad. Uh, we had one person in the front of the sled with ski poles tied to the sled as almost like the gas and brake. And then two people in the back uh, holding on to cords that are tied to the sled and they were primarily the brake people. So uh, we practiced this the week before at the resort 
and uh, you know on on groomed trails, and so I didn't think it was going to be too bad. Uh, we didn't strap my arms down so that way I could sort of protect myself if this thing did get out of control. Uh, so we start going down the slope, and immediately we realized the snow conditions are completely different than how we practice. There's a lot of powder. Uh, it's not groomed. I'm going over big bumps and rocks, and the sled wants to tip. We we have to like traverse across the slope, and I'm trying to like keep my weight, you know, uphill so that way I don't roll over. Um, but snow is just filling the sled from every direction, uh, and then uh, despite our efforts to tie the sled together, uh, it split in half, and so I had snow coming up. Uh, basically under my butt uh, and, and filling the sled and uh, we had to stop and uh, I, I had to get out and uh, we had to retie everything so um, that wasted a lot of time uh, and then there's two teams that passed me including uh, including that Czech team that had to go down for that ski so it's pretty impressive that they were able to catch up and, and uh, pass us on that downhill uh, when we got to the bottom, I finally was able to get out of that thing, and we were giving uh, two bullets each for the shooting. So we uh, you know, transitioned to go back uphill. We skin over to the firing positions. The targets were two-foot diameter balloons ranging from 150 meters out to 200 meters. We were shooting down onto them, but it wasn't anything uh, too dramatic to where we had to compensate for the high angle. Uh, we ended up uh, sort of sitting on our butts and then crossing our ski poles in front of us and then using like a bag or something to support our arm and uh, it seemed to work out pretty well. Um, my rifle was attached to my bag which was just dragged down the slope and the ACOG was covered with tape but didn't exactly uh, keep all the snow out so uh, when it came time for me to shoot I ended up missing both of my shots uh, but we were able to run up and uh, do the penalty distance uphill uh, to get more rounds and uh, ended up uh, shooting all the targets. Then we moved uphill until we got to the time distance planning station. Uh, so when you got to the station, they gave you the next checkpoint on the route and you had to tell them when you'd get there. Uh, if we told them an hour, uh, for example, and we got there in 40 minutes, then our time would just be an hour. But if we got there later, they would double or triple the time uh, over your estimation. So it was about two kilometers and 300 meters uphill. Uh, so our, our captain, Tim, submitted, I think it was like 60 minutes or 65 minutes, and we got there right on time. However, other teams were waiting at the top to meet their times exactly. Uh, and that sort of created a bottleneck because the next thing that we had to do was a long ridge traverse. And so we had about three teams trying to do this traverse at the same time. Uh, it was a little sketchy. There was maybe a low probability of, of falling during these uh, scrambling uh, places, uh, but it was definitely high consequence if you fell. You'd probably be falling for a long time, but there was scrambling, narrow, icy, slash, snowy rock ridges. Uh, and in some places, there was fixed ropes. Uh, and then you got across. Again, you reach another summit, and then you transition to downhill. And then you get to the ski orienteering station. You're basically given a little strip map that you determine a distance and direction to these little land nav points. Uh, skiing was actually pretty nice powder, but by this time everyone's legs were toast. Uh, kind of a shame that this was the nicest skiing of the whole race. And you know, you start high and you hit all the points on the way down the, the slope as a team. And the last point that we got to was the hand grenade range. This was getting near the end of the race. Uh, everyone had to throw these training grenades into a pit. Everyone had to throw two and then after you throw the two, anyone who didn't get theirs into the pit uh, had to go run and grab the uh, grenade training grenades, and then at that point anyone could throw it. Um, we did that standing and kneeling, 
and uh, you know we found who was good at throwing the grenades and after everyone you know missed their first two they just basically gave their their two grenades to the person that we knew were just gonna nail it every time then the last event was the quick march it was the last like three kilometers of the race slightly uphill along a snow-covered road other people probably knew this but what i didn't realize at the time was that the time between the start of this event and the end of the race was multiplied by 10 so if you did this section in 30 minutes you're really adding 300 minutes to your time uh, we walked it at the same pace that we had been the whole race uh, came across the finish line in the middle of the ceremony uh, and that was that. Uh, come to find out later on that some of the fast teams actually tied their slower racers to their faster racers and basically dragged them through the last little bit. It was pretty smart since uh, every second counts as 10. And uh, that was the race. I'd say the most important things I took away from the race were one, be efficient both when you're moving, like with kick turns and route selection, and being able to ski a long distance without needing to stop and give your legs a break. And then also be efficient with when you do stop, getting skins off and on uh, quickly, getting food and water in you. Those extra couple seconds here and there turn into hours when you're talking about over a two day period. Number two, I would say that resort skiing is a good start, but military skiing in that ungroomed, difficult, like off piece, so to speak, uh, or off trail, both downhill and uphill, in the trees, through the rocks, uh, it's completely different. We definitely lost some time coming out of our skis and walking part of the route because we didn't think there was enough snow on the path or the path was too narrow. In you know, other teams would save a bunch of time just by keeping their skis on and just dealing with it. And that's definitely something I want to work on. And the third thing that I learned from this race is something that I've known for a while, but this was definitely something that drove the point home, was that mountain infantry is a completely distinct subset of combat arms. In the winter in the Alps, if you can't ski, you're just a fish out of water. And if you don't know how to evaluate avalanche hazards when you're in that terrain, you're effectively surrounded by landmines. It's such a harsh and dangerous environment if you don't know what you're doing. Despite all that, in 2019 we sent one team, 2023 we sent two teams, so we in total three teams of eight National Guardsmen who trained on their own time in addition to their regular jobs. Yes, some of us work full time for the Guard, uh, but it was no one's full-time job to get ready for this race. We trained together, at least this year, one week end in January, and then the one week leading up to the race when we decided who was going to be on what team. And with that small amount of t uh, training, three out of the three teams that started the f races finished the race, and you know one of the teams actually came in 10th of 22. On that team was like restaurant manager, two students, and a cadet. Uh, imagine if we prioritized and had whole units of mountaineers like the European countries do. And forget about the race, we'd easily be able to control and protect these mountain areas with our NATO and non-NATO allies. And I think that's the goal, being such a force that whether it's in the European Alps or mountainous Asian islands, or in North America, we're so proficient in the mountains that no one even tries to use them against us. And I'll leave it there. If you guys have any questions or comments, uh, put it below or email me. If you think you have what it takes to race, or if this stuff interests you, reach out, we'll see uh, what works with your situation. Thanks for listening and keep listening because I have more talks on the way.